Tragedy is often chaotic. It doesn't affect only one person or even two, but waves and ripples of people. Sometimes strangers go missing under suspiciously similar circumstances, and we have to pause and consider if there's a sinister connection. Three African-American toddlers disappeared in New York within six months of one another in 1989, and one of their mothers was even murdered. None of the children have been seen again, and the murder remains unsolved. Today on Dark Matters, the disappearance of Andre Terrence Bryant, the murder of his mother, Monique Rivera, and the disappearances of Christopher Milton Dansby and Shane Anthony Walker. Twenty-five-year-old Monique Rivera was a devoted mother of three boys, the youngest of whom was just six weeks old. Little Andre Bryant was born on February 17, 1989, to Monique and 24-year-old Timothy Bryant, a shipping clerk for a garment company based out of Manhattan, New York. The family of five happily lived in their Brooklyn apartment until March of 1989, when everything changed. On Tuesday, March 28, 1989, Monique, Andre, and her eldest sons, Timothy Jr. and Thomas, took a leisurely walk around their neighborhood when, in 1988 or 1989, Burgundy Pontiac Grand Am Sports Edition pulled up alongside them. The windows were tinted and the license plates appeared to be out of state, possibly from Maryland. When the windows rolled down, Monique was met with two African-American women. One was approximately 30 years old and heavier set. The other looked to be in her early 20s with long red hair. Both women were about 5 foot 7 inches tall. Immediately, the women struck up a conversation with Monique about her children. The younger of the two women seemed especially interested in six-week-old Andre, saying, let me see the baby, and asking to hold him. After talking for a bit, the women persuaded Monique to go shopping with them. Later that day, Monique returned home from the trip with a new outfit she'd purchased from a store known as Canadians. She also showed her husband a pair of gold pants and a black shirt that she claimed the women bought for her on a fraudulent credit card. Timothy disapproved of this, but Monique had already made plans to shop with them again in White Plains, New York the next day. Monique called on Timothy's sister, Patricia Bryant, to babysit the children during the trip. Patricia immediately thought it was odd that the women were buying her clothes, as Monique had her own money to purchase clothing. But she came over to babysit anyways. Wednesday, March 29, 1989. The two women phoned Monique from a payphone around the corner from her apartment, asking her to bring Andre along on the shopping trip. Monique agreed and was last seen getting into the car with the women around 2 p.m. that day, but when night fell and the hours ticked by, her family knew that something was wrong. Thursday, March 30th, 1989. Monique still hadn't returned home and enough time passed that Timothy could report his wife missing. Earlier that day in the Bronx area of New York, a jogger discovered a body near the East Chester Bay in a patch of woods. The body was female with no identification and she'd been bludgeoned and strangled to death. It isn't until that Sunday when Timothy placed a desperate ad in the paper pleading for help finding his wife that police made the connection. The murdered woman was none other than Monique Rivera and her six-week-old son Andre was nowhere to be found. There was no sign of Andre, and no sign of the women police presumed took him. All three had vanished into thin air, leaving behind a murdered mother and her grieving family. The two women have never been identified, though police found information that possibly showed Monique knew one of the women from middle school. The family wasn't able to remember any names, so no official connection has ever been made. Even with witness interviews, tips, and divers scouring the East Chester Bay, the car, the women, and little Andre seemingly vanished into thin air. Two and a half months later, on Thursday, May 18, 1989, a mother took her two-year-old son, Christopher Milton Dansby, to her apartment complex's playground. While at the Martin Luther King Jr. Towers playground, located in Harlem, New York, 
The mother decided to run to the store while Christopher played, since she didn't have his stroller. Relatives at the park agreed to watch over him, and she left, returning a short time later. However, upon scanning the park, Christopher was nowhere to be seen. When she asked her relatives where he'd gone, they claimed they'd last seen him playing with a red ball and two children, a boy and a girl. Immediately, the mother was alarmed. Christopher didn't own or bring a red ball to the playground, and the two children last seen with him were also nowhere to be found. The red ball, Christopher's playmates, and young Christopher were gone. Later that same day, a seven-year-old boy who lived in the same neighborhood confessed to police he'd seen Christopher after his disappearance. He alleged Christopher was walking down 111th Street with an unknown African-American man sporting braided hair. This was the last known sighting of Christopher, and the investigation went cold. Little Shane Anthony Walker was just 19 months old, but he was the light of his parents' life. His mother, Rosa Glover, a cook at Columbia University, took delight in seeing Shane grow, always smiling and fascinated with teddy bears and monkeys, specifically the family pet chimpanzee, James. Little Shane delighted in feeding James bananas through a cage, and on a family vacation to Disney World, he'd taken a liking to the rides, but an aversion to Disney's signature mascot. However, the happy memories abruptly ended in the summer of 1989. Thursday, August 10th, 1989, at the corner of 113th and Lenox Avenue in Harlem, Rosa took Shane to the Martin Luther King Jr. Towers playground, the very same where Christopher disappeared from at the beginning of the summer. Rosa and Shane also lived in the Martin Luther King Jr. Towers project apartments. It seemed like any other day. Rosa sat on a nearby bench, snacking on chips and watching Shane play. Then, suddenly, two children, a 10-year-old girl and her 5-year-old brother, approached her, asking permission to play with Shane, who was on the swing. Likely thinking it was strange that older children wanted to play with a toddler, she told them he was young, but they seemed eager anyways, saying, we don't mind. The trio played near the slide, and around that moment, an African-American man struck up a conversation with Rosa, which quickly turned eerie. He talked about crime, saying that things, quote, happened to children, and he even mentioned kidnapping specifically. Then he pointed to scars on his body, the result of fighting, he said. After examining the scars, Rosa turned back to the playground, and Shane, along with the brother and sister, were gone. Immediately, Rosa was on her feet, shouting for Shane, scouring the playground for her son. And that's when she spotted the same brother and sister re-entering the park through a hole in the fence. Panicked, she asked them where Shane was. The children claimed they'd left him inside the park, but he was nowhere to be found. Rosa Glover immediately took the children down to the police station to report her son missing. The children were questioned, as was the man speaking with Rosa while Shane vanished, and all of them were released. The search was underway when Rosa, just days later, received a phone call from someone claiming Shane was buried in an abandoned building. However, after the authorities investigated this claim, they found it to be unreliable. As the leads died down, the investigation slowed, and eventually it went cold, but Shane was still missing. Looking at these cases, there are parts of each story that could almost be swapped out or confused for one another, simply by how similar they are. In this section, we're going to highlight what even Ron Jones, the senior case manager with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, calls a hell of a coincidence. The relevance of these details may seem arbitrary, but this ties into the theory section, so I promise it's important. So, between the three cases, all of the children are very young, African-American males. Andre was six weeks, Christopher was two years, and Shane was about one and a half years old. Both Chris and Shane lived in the same apartment building, and some people believe they resemble one another, including myself. Chris and Shane also both disappeared on a Thursday, around the same time frame, with Chris vanishing around 7 p.m. and Shane around 5 p.m. Chris and Shane both disappeared while playing in the same area of the same park. And in my opinion, the most eerie similarity is the 10-year-old girl and her 5-year-old brother. 
These were the same two children playing with both Chris and Shane just before each toddler disappeared. We'll get into the implications of this in the theory section. Now, just to be clear, police haven't officially confirmed that Shane and Christopher's disappearances are connected, but they've entertained the possibility. And in connection with Andre's case, again, it can't be confirmed, though it seems a little less likely than Shane and Christopher's connection. So why is it many people believe these kidnappings are a part of a much bigger, much more sinister form of kidnapping? A majority of children who go missing are either runaways or children taken by non-custodial parents. However, in all three of these cases, familial kidnappings have been ruled out and they are considered stranger abductions. So why were there two extremely similar and one very similar kidnappings of the same demographic in such a short period of time? The main theory is that Andre, Christopher, and Shane were all kidnapped in connection with one or multiple black market operations. Does this necessarily mean that all three children were taken by the exact same person or the exact same operation? No, but what it's theorized is that they were all taken with the same intent, to sell them. But that doesn't tell us what they were sold for, if this is in fact what happened to them. Two of the main options would be human trafficking, whether that be sexual or labor-purposed, or that they were sold on the adoption black market. For the kidnappings to be successful on a wider scale without attracting police or media attention, they likely would have needed what I'll call lures, people used to draw children away without attracting attention or suspicion. In this theory, the lures in Andre's case were the women who enticed Monique to bring him along on the shopping trip with them. In Shane and Christopher's cases, the lures would have been the 10-year-old girl and the 5-year-old brother, the two children both toddlers were last seen playing with before vanishing. Now, obviously, two adult women would have known what they were doing, but maybe utilizing children seems far-fetched. However, the children could have been luring kids away, taking them to adults who would reward them without really knowing why or for what purpose. I personally find it a highly strange coincidence at best or a concrete connection at worst that the same siblings were last seen with Christopher and Shane before they disappeared. And not only that, but the last to play with them as well. And if you'll remember, the children approached Shane's mother to play with him, despite the fact he was much younger than them. It's completely possible the children just happened to live in the same apartment complex and were always on the playground, absolutely. But if anything, it's an eerie coincidence, regardless if it's relevant or not. While it's horrifying to think that there was some operation to kidnap and sell African-American toddlers in 1989, my research showed that black toddlers and infants on the regular adoption market are generally sold for less than mixed-race or Caucasian children. According to The Economist, prospective parents looking to adopt could save $8,000 if they adopt a black baby, especially if he's male, as girls cost about $2,000 more than boys. Also, occasionally Canadian and European adopters will look to America to adopt children, and Economist claims that they are also less race and less gender biased than American parents. According to NPR, adopting an African American child possibly hastens the adoption process because, quote, they have children of color waiting. This is a picture from the article showing various children being placed for adoption and their costs. And you can see that purely African-American children, in comparison to other children, cost less. Keep in mind this is all statistics for the surface adoption market, the legal one, not the black market one. But following the same principles, it's possible the adoption black market may have the same prejudices as surprising and sort of revolting as this is to me personally. So, seeing the statistics and the nature of the crimes, it seems possible the children were kidnapped and sold under the radar, especially since young black males were likely to sell the fastest based on price alone, if the black market works the same way. Not to mention that black children who go missing often receive less media attention than any other race, and this occurred in a project housing area, at least concerning Christopher and Shane. It's likely the perpetrators chose their victims, counting on this. Now, concerning Andre, it's possible this wasn't a ploy to sell the child, but some sort of revenge or payback plot that targeted Monique and her family. 
Some speculate that if the women did in fact know Monique from middle school, that taking Andre and harming Monique was some sort of revenge. But again, because the identities of the women couldn't be confirmed, this remains just a theory for now. Then, of course, we have to entertain the possibility that while eerily similar, the kidnappings were three separate, unrelated incidents with different perpetrators who had different motives. Regardless of not knowing exactly what happened, the fact remains that Andre's, Christopher's, and Shane's families still have no answers, and it has likely haunted them. As of right now, the fate of these three children can only be speculated upon and not confirmed. All three of the victims' families have open wounds and unanswered questions. Timothy Bryant and his sons, Timothy Jr. and Thomas Bryant, were forced to continue life without Monique and without Andre. Thomas hopes his brother is alive and well and that one day they can meet face to face so he can, quote, see what kind of man he developed into. Hope is a common theme among these families as Rosa, Shane's mother, also believes her son is alive. She and Shane's father dearly long to have their only son back home or to at least know his whereabouts and what happened that day. The couple still lives in the area he disappeared from, but steer clear of the playground, as the memories are too painful to face head on. We wish the families of this tragedy only the best going forward and hope that one day they can have answers. All three of the cases are classified as non-family abductions, and all three boys are African American, have black hair and brown eyes, and disappeared the same year. Andre Terrence Bryant was six weeks old and was wearing a gray suit with two horizontal red lines, a beige knitted hat and sweater, and white socks. If alive, he would be 28 years old. Christopher Milton Dansby was two years old when he disappeared, had a birthmark shaped like a figure eight on his back, along with a burn scar on his thigh. He was last seen in a blue jacket with a floral print shirt, blue jeans, and green and white sneakers. If alive, he would be 30 years old. And Shane Anthony Walker was 19 months when he disappeared. At the time, he often wore his hair braided and pulled back into a ponytail. He was last seen in a blue and white shirt, light blue pants, and white LA gear sneakers. He had a small scar under his chin and, if alive, would be 29 years old. If you have any information on the circumstances of their disappearances or those involved in the murder of Monique Rivera, please contact the New York City Police Department's Missing Persons Unit at 212-694-7781 or the New York City Police Department Squad 28 at 212-876-7100. Special thanks to the Patreon family. The names you see on screen are just some of the people who financially contribute to this channel. Whether they are passionate about cases like Andre, Christopher, and Shane's, or the other dark content on this channel, their support cannot be overstated. If you are interested in supporting the channel, information is in the description, but even if you only continue to support by watching, thank you. Thank you for giving Andre, Christopher, and Shane's cases a moment of your time. No matter what you choose to believe or what you speculate, I ask you only for respect in the comments below. And remember, though these may be dark matters, the darkness always matters. Thank you for watching the video. Exposure to these cases is highly important. And to those of you who support this channel by watching, contributing, or buying merchandise, thank you. If you want to see other unsolved cases or dark content, be sure to subscribe to this channel. Stay safe, friends, and have a good night.